May your goodness leap into our hearts through your word today, dear Lord. Amen. Last week we began talking about the words of Jesus from Luke 16. No servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money or mammon or things. And we looked at the golden calf and realized that they weren't replacing the true God with the golden calf, but kind of putting that golden calf beside the true God so that they would have something physical, visual, that they could trust in and how that leads to destruction. Well, today we're going to take another step in this series, your relationship to God and money, looking at the sower, the seed, and the harvest. Please read this verse with me. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And as we do this, we have to realize that really we're talking about farming. Now, I'm going to ask a question. I've asked this at every service. How many of you live on a working farm from which you earn your income? Raise your hand. We've had two this whole weekend. Now, how many of you grew up on a farm from which you earned your income? Quite a few more. Keep your hands up. And how many of your parents grew up on a farm from which they earned their income? Quite a few more. So, in reality, from when I was a child, about 40% of the United States labor force was involved in agriculture. When I became an adult, it was down to about 20%. Today, those who actually live on a farm from which they get their income is down to about 2% in our country. So when we study God's Word and it talks about farming, we don't know a lot about it, do we? So we have to get the context. It reminds me of the farmer who was involved in a trial because there was a terrible accident and he was injured. The lawyer brought him to the judge and said to him, Sir, did you or did you not say to the state trooper at the scene of the accident that you were just fine? And the farmer said, Well, you see, I was hitching up my mule and the lawyer interrupted him. No, 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 no. Don't go into the story. Just tell me, did you or did you not tell the state trooper that you were just fine? And he said, well, you got to understand that I hitched my mule to the trailer and the lawyer tried to shut him up again and finally the judge said, wait a minute, I'm curious now, I want to hear his story. So the farmer said, I hitched my mule to my trailer and I was going across the road and a great big semi truck came and hit us right in the side and my poor old mule Bessie flew into one ditch. I flew into the other ditch. I was hurt really bad. I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. But I could hear my poor mule Bessie just bellowing and howling in the next ditch. I felt so bad for her. She was in miserable shape. And the state trooper got there and went and looked at Bessie and felt bad for her. So he pulled out his service revolver and, and shot her right between the eyes to put her out of her misery. Then he came onto my side of the ditch and he was still holding the gun. And he asked me how I was doing. So I said, I'm doing just fine, officer. <laughs> Context is everything, isn't it? So let's get into the context of farming just a little bit. Point number one, we are called to be farmers, not miners. Okay? I, I grew up with farmers. I've worked for farmers. I absolutely think they can do anything. They are wonderful people. And one of the things that they are are stewards of the land. They put back into the land more than they take out of it. Via fertilizer, by sowing seed, by managing erosion, and so forth. Miners, now there's nothing wrong with being a miner. Don't, get, don't misunderstand me here. We need miners. But in, in, in the context of stewardship, that's not what God calls us to do. He doesn't call us to just take. He calls us to be a steward, a manager of all of the things he has given us, including his grace. So with that in mind, we're going to look at the sower, the seed, and the harvest. First of all, the heart of the sower. Please read with me. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. 
for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, this particularly is about giving money, but it applies to all of our lives, our time, our abilities, our willingness to lead and to work. And so keep that in mind as we walk through the heart of the sower. Some key words there, he has decided. In the Greek, this is a word with a P-R-O, a pro suffix before the word, and that means ahead of time. So the point is you are to decide ahead of time, kind of almost like budgeting, how much of yourself and of your resources you're going to give back to God. That's why we do pledging in church. It's a biblical thing to take a look at that and prayerfully decide how much time am I going to give to the Lord? How many Sundays am I going to worship? I'm going to commit ahead of time to be there every week. How much of my income am I going to give to the Lord? I'm going to commit to such and such an amount. It's ahead of time. Not only is it ahead of time, but it is decided in his heart. Now, when we look at that, we think, well, it must be an emotional decision, but not so. In the biblical days, the heart was the seat or the place of decision-making, not of emotions. They didn't understand the brain, you know, being the mind where maybe we think things through and make decisions. It was the heart. Their seat of emotion makes more sense to me than the heart. They would say that you feel things in your liver. Okay? That sounds kind of odd to us. But when something bad happens, where does it hurt? Oh, you get a stomach ache, don't you? Unless you have a heart attack, and then it's too late anyway. So we'll just stick with that. Ahead of time, a conscious, logical, thought-through decision, and a cheerful one. Hilarion is the word there, which means hilarious and happy. I've had church leaders tell me when they look at the books and see who gives how much money, it's hilarious sometimes. But that's not what they're talking about here in the Bible. They're talking about joyful happy giving. That's how we're. So let's take a look at the principles. First of all, decision is to be made ahead of time, not last minute scrambling for how much we'll give. Decision lies with the giver in his heart, his seat of decision making, not out of compulsion, not reluctantly. And you'll, you know, I, I get a little weary of hearing ministries and churches asking people to give to a budgetary need or a budget. Budgets are important and we've got to meet those needs, but what's important is that we're giving out of how God has blessed us, not out of something that somebody else needs. God will provide all of our needs, and therefore when it's done in that way, it is done cheerfully. Okay, now, I absolutely love this next one, and I want you to read it with me. And we'll emphasize it after we do so. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Isn't that cool? The abundance of the seed. God gives and gives and gives all, 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 all that we need. Our time, our talents, our treasures, our ability to do good works. I, I've never seen, you know, in Scripture a passage that hits the same theme that many times in such a concise way. Some principles from this one. Read that first one with me. Our God is a God of abundance and not scarcity. I hope you believe that because it is nothing but the truth. Everything comes from him. And this next principle, sparse sowing is not from a lack of seed, but a lack of trust. Think that one through for just a minute. Think of the sack of seeds at the time of the children's message. If I don't trust God to provide, I want to keep all of those seeds. And it's a lack of trust that if I sow some of them, he will cause the harvest to happen. How many people are hurt so badly by being stingy and it ruins their life? 
That's the seed. How about the harvest? I'll read this one. He who supplies seed to the sower. Oh, that's good, isn't it? He who supplies seed to the sower. That's God. And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. God will take care of it and he will give you a harvest. Verse 11, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And that thanksgiving to God is because there will be more people in heaven. That's what we're really sowing. We're not giving to an institution. We're not giving to a program. We're giving our time, our abilities, our treasures to reach people with Jesus. That is the bottom line. Two principles here. One I call the big shovel principle. The bigger a shovel you sow with, the bigger shovel God's going to dump the harvest on you. But he doesn't do that just to make you rich. He does that so that you have even more to give so that more can know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And that's that last principle there. The harvest of righteousness involves a Copernican revolution or revelation, if you will, in each of us. Copernicus was the scientist who discovered that the earth revolves around the sun, that the sun and everything else doesn't revolve around the earth. Sometimes we need that kind of a revelation to realize that everything doesn't revolve around me, that it's about other people at other times, and that's what the harvest is is all about. This past week I received a phone call one very, very busy day that an individual who was a father of someone who was going to be married soon was dying. Is there any way that we could do anything, any kind of a ceremony so he could see the marriage? Well, this was about an hour's drive away, but I canceled what I had and got in the car and drove there. And we went through this kind of pre-marriage ceremony so the old man could see his daughter say her vows. And afterwards, the family asked if I could talk to him because they weren't sure if he believed in Jesus. So we gathered around his bed and we talked about a Savior who died for him, a Savior who gave his whole life so that those who believe in him would go to heaven, a Savior who suffered the cross and came up out of the empty tomb. And when we shared some scriptures and talked for a while, I just flat out asked him, do you believe this? And he very clearly nodded his head and said yes and folded his hands. And we prayed. The next day, he came very close to death. And he brought his hands together and shook them. And one of the family members said, do you want to pray? And he shook his head. And they prayed a prayer of salvation. And he closed his eyes. And he went to Jesus. See, it wasn't about my busy schedule. It wasn't about what I might have had time for. It wasn't about a family that didn't know what to say. It was about his soul being in heaven. That's the harvest. That's what we give ourselves to. That's what we have joined together to be all about. Building one another up. Feeding on God's word so people at every age can be led to Christ. I have some questions for you to ponder this week, and we'll gather next week to share again. First of all, ask yourself, are you farming or mining with God's blessings? Are you just taking or are you giving? Secondly, how are you sowing? Generously? Sacrificially? 
or scarcely? Thirdly, where are you sowing? This is an interesting question. Are you sowing in the harvest field of God's kingdom to bring people to Jesus? Or are you sowing in the world? Are you sowing and giving and spending in places of silliness and uselessness? Think that through. That's a tough one. And finally, why are you sowing? Why are you giving of yourself where you're giving it? And I pray that the answer to that question is that more people will have the peace of God, which passes all understanding. And may it be yours and through your work, theirs. Amen.